Talk. Hi. Hello and welcome to Knock Knock High with the Glockam Flag. You startled I came in me. Hot. I came in hot on that one. You sure did. I am Will Flannery, also known as Dr. Glockam Flecken. I'm Kristen Flannery, also known as Lady Glockam Flecken. You know I was, I, I'm excited about this episode. Usually you like take a beat or two. You no, know, I'm I was just, waiting I'm, for that. I'm mm-hmm. going right, you right sure into are. it. You've had your coffee. Man, it, we, so before we, uh, you know, one thing that's been on my mind is, is, just you, one. Just one thing. That's all that's one in thing, there. A, a one neuron. Mm-hmm. Just little firing this morning. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was remarking with the producers before uh, you, well, as you yeah. were getting ready for the podcast, I, of course, sat down mm-hmm. and uh, got here a few minutes early. Well, hold on. You know I wasn't getting ready for the podcast, right? I was already ready. Okay. I'm doing things around the house and with my work. I'm not. I'm not criticizing you. What I'm. Gonna, what I'm saying, and uh, is that I find it uh, impressive mm. that you can just come in mm-hmm. to our little studio here. Yep. Sit down with like twenty seconds before mm-hmm. we have to go live with the guest. Twenty seconds early, and you're just ready to go. Like I need to sit down. I need to like. Like get my mind right mm-hmm. and like sit. I need like five minutes. At well, least, my my like neurons fire seconds. faster than yours. That's all. You're like twenty seconds. I'm good. I'm yeah, good. I got what I need. I was just putting a little laundry. In I was. And, I was washing the kids' sheets. And then you come and sit down. Bam, we're going. Yep. Because I've already thought about it. I've already prepared. I'm good to go. Also, I work better under pressure. I have realized that with mm-hmm. you. Yeah. Yep. You you um tend to wait a little bit on things Mm -hmm. apply uh, create some pressure and then i (laughs) then i'm on it but uh yeah i came in hot because uh we have a guest that's it's a very exciting guest uh that is a little bit off the beaten path for as a topic something we haven't touched on yet yes Uh, we are very important very important we're talking to gita pensa md she's an adjunct associate professor of emergency medicine at brown university and a physician at Brown uh, University Health and Wellness. And she has a fascinating story um, uh, regarding litigation. So she is a, she speaks nationally on the topic of malpractice litigation and litigation stress. Uh, She has, she's been to like trial twice, like a, like 12 Mm -hmm. years of her life was, was taken up by a malpractice case. case. Uh, So she talks a lot about that during our uh, conversation uh, she has an open access podcast curriculum, which is a podcast curriculum. Yeah, it's a cool idea. Like you can you can listen to this podcast yeah. and learn so much about litigation. So it's called. People have been assigned her podcast curriculum in their, in their uh, studies. classes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so the podcast uh, curriculum is called Doctors and Litigation, the L Word. Uh, and uh, basically just she just does an incredible job of, of shining light on this this topic that we don't get any med- any education on as right. physicians. Uh, and so it's this black box and, and it doesn't, it shouldn't be, we need, we need more education about this stuff. So we talk about all of this uh, fascinating stories, just a whole different world than, than I've, we've ever been in. I, I, I mentioned later on that I, I did serve on a, like a one day jury, but that's mm-hmm. as far as close as I ever got to, the the justice system and so, i got called in for jury duty once and i had to spend a few hours there but then they didn't end up needing us and they just let us all go home before we did anything so it was just a, a way to miss work for a morning and get to read a book <laughs> there you go <laughs> obviously we have a lot to learn during this interview so let's get to it all right let's here's go. dr pinsa do you want to tell them or should i you can. All right. We're telling our amazing story live in person. Oh, you mean the story where you died? Uh, no, the one where you survived me dying. Oh, yeah, right. We can't wait. We're going to be a meet and greet before each show. Uh, you can get a photo with us. You can meet us. We want to meet you December 9th, 10th, and 11th in Southern California. We'll be at the Improv in Irvine, Ontario, and Oxnard. To buy tickets and check out the dates, go to glockenflecken.com slash live. And we have a special offer for our Patreon members, the Glock Flock, free meet and greet with a normal ticket. Just tell us your username and you're in. See you in Southern California. <laughs> All right, we are here with Dr. Pensa. Thank you for joining us. We're so excited to talk with you. 
Uh, I don't have... I don't have, know if you have any idea how excited I am to be talking to you. Uh, I am a huge, huge, huge fan of and an admirer of all that you do. I enjoy the content. Well, thank um, you. I'm just, I'm such a huge super fan. So. And everything that he does as well, right? <laughs> That's right. Yes. <laughs> Both of you, and, and... in your own rights, I enjoy well, and admire. You yeah. didn't bring. You didn't wear your emergency your your bicycle helmet. That and that's fine. That's okay. <laughs> um, we'll we'll be able to to keep going. But you you have some fans as well because we were several people reached out and said that we should have you on this podcast. Oh, and, that is And then so hearing awesome. hearing about your your bio, everything that you've gone through and what you do, it, it's it's uh, definitely like we're excited about this. But before we get into it. I, mean, I thought I'd I'd kind of ex- try to explain to Kristen why this topic is so interesting to physicians. Okay. So we're going to talk about malpractice okay. a lot today um, and like litigation and stuff. You know how – so I like uh, – Gita, I like scary movies, big horror movie fan. And Kristen is like – she's always like, I don't understand why. Like why do you like – to watch this, like horrible things happening. Uh, what, what's the what's the appeal about this? And there's something about like watching a scary movie. And it's like, like what if this happened to me? Kind of thing. Like what 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 would I do? What it's, that's it's, exactly it's why this, I don't like, like morbid, to watch them. <laughs> it's like a morbid curiosity. Well, it's, it's almost exactly the same with listening to but stories you would certainly about not malpractice. Trip while you were running yeah. away. I know you wouldn't trip while you were <laughs> right. running yes. away, and you wouldn't go in the room yeah. that you weren't supposed to go in. Right. Exactly. Don't go in the house in. alone. Yeah. Right. 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 All the things. Right. And so, uh, and so, it's it's very. I feel like listening to people talk about malpractice and litigation and and these 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 sometimes horrifying, terrifying stories is it's kind of a similar feeling like to to watching a horror movie and like right oh or like a gosh, true crime. Like what if show. that happened to me? What yeah. if, what would I do in that situation? Oh, it's it's just has a has a similar vibe to me, and so. That's why I am so curious about what you have to say, and 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 I want to hear all about what you do, and so um, so thank you for being here, and uh, you know thank you for uh, for providing like a little horror show, horror movie for us here. <laughs> this is this is how we all know that you don't have anxiety, and <laughs> I do because my own mind show. is a horror movie, and you need the external uh, stimulation of someone else's imagination. Right. Mine's just running that all the time. Well, I guess let's start here. Okay. Tell us why, like litigation, why this is something that that we should talk about, because this is, this is a lot of times this is this is kind of a taboo topic, right? We don't we yes. don't just a lot of this isn't out in the open, and and so why is this important for I guess not just physicians but anybody in healthcare to to discuss? Well, the most important reason I think is that our keeping this subject taboo really perpetuates this culture of shame that we have around litigation. But litigation happens to, I mean, you you speak as someone who it sounds like you probably haven't been sued from the way that you're I have not. The way yes. you're talking, Can you right? tell? Knock I, on all the wood. <laughs> I'll, I'll knock on all the wood for you. Um, but <laughs> but you probably, I don't know, when you were a student or a resident, do you think you could have named any attendings of yours who had been sued? Did you know when any of them were being sued? I I didn't. No. You didn't, uh, right? I didn't. Uh, they didn't. I guess I can't think of any, and maybe they just—they probably just didn't talk about it so much. Uh-huh. I mean, I—I've I, heard, I've heard people like at conferences, like like dis- like it was a topic of conversation at a, at a conference. But I feel like it's no personal stories. Oh, wait, that's not true. I mean, I, no, somebody I work with. Yeah, yeah. So not in residency, educated, mm-hmm. but I I have heard some stories from people I've since worked then, with. So, right. But you weren't so, trained yeah, in any then, way. Yes. You weren't trained in any way. No, watching no, someone as a role model go through. You had no like role models of resilience. You had, you know, your department chair. No one was saying like, oh, I'm going through this now. This is how I weathered it. You don't have any. There's no uh, sort of generational knowledge in medicine being right. passed from like attendings to young physicians to medical students or anything like that. And the way this became really important to me was that I got sued. Um, and, uh, to make a super long story, uh, shorter, um, I was named, uh, I was about five years out of residency and I was at the time I was a nocturnist. So I was an emergency physician, um, in a community hospital working nights and there was no hospitalist at night. So I used to be the only doctor in the hospital. 
so nice to like have to leave the emergency department to like run a code and then come back down. And then there was a, an L and D labor and delivery, uh, labor and delivery floor, but there was no OB in house. And so I would have to go up and like maybe deliver a baby and come back down. And the whole thing was terrifying and exhilarating and awesome. And I thought that I was really, really good at it. And then, um, one day I took care of this woman and I won't right now get into the case, except that will the chief complaint was eye pain. Uh, oh. I know. <laughs> However, oh, um, okay. it was On very, it was floor. super, no, this wasn't the LED floor. This was just actually oh, in the emergency okay. department. <laughs> in the she came in. Oh, okay. Gotcha. She had this gotcha. in the yeah, emergency department. She had eye pain, and um, I didn't. It was weird. Which you guys love. You love the eye pain. We patients, love right? eye pain. <laughs> it's one of yeah. your favorites. Okay. Yeah. Certainly, me now. You can imagine how much I love eye pain. <laughs> yeah, um, right. And she wound up having. I I didn't I didn't find it. I looked for a lot of things. I woke up an ophthalmologist in the middle of the night. I did. I, I did mm. so many things, and then I sent her home. And then something really with a plan to see the ophthalmologist, by the way, at like nine, I sent her home at 630. And then somewhere between now and the ophthalmologist appointment, she had a massive stroke and she was 30 years oh old my. and she was an engineer. And so if you know anything about litigation, what that equals is a very high demand case, right? You have a young person, high damages and um, lots of economic potential. Uh, and that means that they are coming after you and for a, a lot, a lot, a lot of money. Thorough personality probably. Yeah. Right, right. It was just, yes. it was, it was not a good, it was not a good situation, but the the worst yeah. thing for me was when I got named, I didn't know anything. I didn't know anything. I didn't know who to call. I didn't know. I didn't know who insured me. I didn't know what I was supposed to do because when I was trained as a resident, I got risk management lectures. Like they told me how not to get sued. <laughs> they didn't tell me anything about what to do once, you know, once the finger is pointed at you, what do you do? Right. So, but no one had ever said, so the implication is if you are good, it won't happen to you. Even though abstractly, you know, the numbers, right. You know, the numbers that most physicians that they practice for 30 years, most of us, especially in a high risk field, most of us are going to get sued. Right. And we can't all be bad doctors. So you figure, you know, Right. like maybe it's going to happen but you kind of put this thing on where like that's a horror movie that happens to other people right does not happen to like me like i just said yeah like exactly I said, exactly right it does it doesn't happen to me um and then when it does everything kind of crumbles in your identity where you feel like mm -hmm. you know no one i know or no one who trained me or nobody who i you know this doesn't happen it's not supposed to happen to me i don't know what to do i don't I don't have anyone to talk to. You show up finally and you figure out who to call and you wind up in your insurer's office and the first thing they tell you is don't talk about it. So you don't. Except that there is this thing happening inside your brain and it's not good, right? There's a lot of pain right. and grief and I was really, I felt awful about what happened to this woman. I wanted to like call her or talk to her. Obviously you can't do that, right? I didn't understand what had happened I was dealing with this whole like crushing identity, like loss of identity thing. I thought I was so good at what I did. And all of a sudden I was like, I was wrong. Like I spent decades of my life yeah. to become this thing and I suck at it. And now the whole world is going to see that I suck at it because there is going to be a multi-million verdict, multi-million dollar verdict against me. And it's going to be front page news in the paper. And so when I say this was a long story, what happened was um, it, it took 12 years. Like it took 12 years of my life to wrap this thing 12 up. 12 years. 12 years. I was on, um, oh my I saw this patient in 2006 uh, and I, let's see, went on trial for the first time in 2011. And then there was an, I won. Um, and that was a four and a half week trial. It was incredibly grueling. Oh and God. then, uh, there was an appeal and, uh, my case went through all the layers of the courts and then the verdict got overturned in 2015. And I went on trial a second time in 2018 and I won a second time and then they declined to appeal. And so when I talk about litigation stress, I talk about it from what was, from an understanding of what it was to be the person who was highly, highly distressed by this process right. and did not have any help and did not know who to talk to and was trying to like raise three kids, keep working, keep my head above water. 
no one suggested therapy. There was no support group. And I thought terrible things like on the daily, but it lasted for a really long time. And it wasn't until probably eight or nine, it was probably around the time that my verdict got overturned. Um, when I was, I mean, I went back to work after the first trial, but I was really in a bad, I was not well. Um, but that we do what right. doctors do, which is keep like, just keep showing up. Cause you gotta that's keep what working. you do. Gotta Absolutely. keep working. Just yeah. keep showing up. I'm very to, unhappy. To hell with your mental health. If, oh, you gotta, right. no. you gotta, you gotta shift. No, you show up, you gotta yeah. shift. Right. And right. so, um, but then I, I really, when they were like, you're going back to trial, I was no, 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 no. No. Mm -mm, mm -mm. <laughs> mm -mm. How long was I, the was the gap between the trials? Uh, well, like twenty eleven, seven years. Yep, and oh, then twenty fifteen. It? it took four years to overturn the verdict, and then it took three more years to go back to trial. But something like, I mean, happened it, then yeah. where I decided, like, I can't be like this anymore. And like, there yeah. needs, there has to be someone in the world that like knows how to do this better than me. Like, I can't. I how could this be that we let? Like, I thought of myself as a pretty, like. By then I'd gotten some self-esteem back. I'm like, I'm a pretty normal, like good doctor. Like I'm a good person. I don't have a lot of like usually mental difficulties. I cannot handle this. Like why, why is there no, like, why is there no help for me? Uh, right, and then the I resources? started looking for it. Yeah. And then I yeah. started looking for it. So that is where all this comes from. And uh, so it's a, a very long uh, answer to your initial question, which is why does it matter that we talk about this? Because that's how you change culture. Mm -hmm. I, I don't believe that litigation has to be this career ending, occasionally life ending. We should probably talk about that, right? But this should not be the life destroyer that it is for many physicians. Mm -hmm. Like I, I think it's appropriate to, you know, you can be upset and you'll probably suffer a little bit. And this is what I do now as a coach. I'm a coach for mm -hmm. physicians who are undergoing litigation. Um, there will be some suffering, but there is a way that we can adjust what our mindset is about litigation to make this not about, this is not about us. Right? This is not about you as an individual. It's happening to you. Yeah. It's not a statement of your but worth as a human. No, it is not. Or as a doctor. Yeah. It is not. Right. And this, and, but that is how we interpret it. And so to change culture, right. you've got to talk. Now you mentioned, uh, you know, high, high risk specialties. What, what are those specialties? Cause you're, you obviously, you've mm -hmm. got, I'm sure you talk with a lot of different physicians, Yes. uh, you know, through your coaching and the, the classes that you teach and the yeah. lectures you give, what are you, I'm sure you see themes, right. Mm -hmm. On certain types of physicians. <laughs> oh gosh. Yeah. I could really <laughs> talk about that. Um, so yeah, so how many first ophthalmologists of all, do you see? No. I actually just gave a talk to a whole group of ophthalmologists and there were a number of people in that room who were just like, Oh yeah, I got sued. Yeah. Like it was, you know, once you start talking yeah. about it, people start talking about it. But, yeah. um, well, I have a question before she answers others, that, yeah. which is, and you don't have to say what it is cause I don't want to do any identifying anybody, but, uh, but did you, when she gave you the details, eye pain, then a stroke, Oh. Did you know in your mind what a potential diagnosis would have been or no? No, I mean I I, I don't know. That could so be a lot of So even the ophthalmologist well, I mean, is I'm like, sure that, well, I'm sure there are more details. Go into the ophthalmologist there are, there are and let's look at and I'll you. Tell you but, even now it doesn't make great sense. Yeah. It but 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 I will say it's it's ve it's very often that we get a call in the middle of the night from the emergency physician and I say that's what he says. We'll come, see him in the come morning. Come to clinic first thing <laughs> in the morning, and we'll take a look. And so it it does. It kind of made my stomach drop a little bit to hear like, oh, you know, we get into this. The longer we've been in practice, that like you get into this, um, you know, this um, mindset that you know it's gonna this 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 patient, whatever is going on, it's going to pave like everything else, and nothing's gonna change over the next six hours. It's very easy to kind of just, you know, reassure yourself in that yeah. way. And then, oh, it's it's only six hours. Like, what's the difference? You know, I'll see I'll see the patient in the morning. But then, you know, things can happen. And so it it is a little it is scary to to hear that. Yeah. And it's but, not, I mean, I don't wanna I don't tell, you know, I don't tell these stories to scare people. It's interesting because I I talk to a lot of I do a lot of speaking on this topic. 
And um, sometimes people are like, oh, I think, I think it scares people. I don't know if you should talk to learners. I don't know if you should talk to medical students about this. And I, <laughs> I push back on all of that. Um, I think it's important to know that things happen. You can understand oh, yeah. that they're rare. But when we set this expectation up for doctors, right, that like we, 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 we attract perfectionists mm -hmm. to the specialty, right? Like that's, we, we breed perfectionism too, as we go along, right? We only want the people who can get all the scores and this and that, and you jump through all the hoops and you do all the things. And so these are all perfectionists that are coming through here. And then, you know, we, when you actually practice medicine, as, as you just said, like we're always operating in the gray. We're always operating right. in the gray. Like there's, you know, sometimes, you know, eye pain, stroke, like, I don't know, I got to think about that one. Like there's a lot of things that happen in medicine that aren't concrete. Most of what happens in a day, like if you don't ask yourself the question like a thousand times during a day, like, mm, should I do this or should I do that? Mm, should I give this med or should I give that med? Or like, oh, should we do this procedure or that procedure? Should I, for me, should I send this person home or should I keep them or should I do that CAT scan? Like uh, how many times right. a day do we ask these questions hundreds that don't have of, real answers, of... right? Exactly. But so many decisions, we right? Put this this bar of like you may never make a mistake and there must never be an adverse event. And mm -hmm. we basically are tasked with the impossible. That's an impossible ask, right? And right. then the <laughs> the punishment for not achieving the impossible is quite severe. And mm -hmm. that is something that most people, like, we can't operate like that forever. And so maybe we should ask ourselves the question of, like, is that actually a reasonable expectation? And what is it in our culture that breeds that expectation for us? And we, how right. do we keep it all alive? Because we do. And so, and, and the this idea ties that in you in so many ways to just the struggle of physicians mm -hmm. right now. Right. Yeah, the idea that you shouldn't talk to to trainees about it because it's scary. It's like, well, it's a reality and life is scary sometimes. And that doesn't mean we shouldn't talk about it. And what's scarier, having been trained in what to do if it happens or just being out on your own when exactly. it happens and not having any of the resources or knowledge it's to happened. know how to, to deal with it. I'm, so I, I think that's a flawed argument. I'm telling you, like, <laughs> there is so much you don't know about the healthcare system, about practicing medicine um, that you you learn about once you get into tr uh, practice, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, uh, I think there's a big part of that is just failure of the education system and realizing what we need to focus on and some of the real world problems. Uh, I'm, and right now my head is full of all these healthcare topics. I've been doing this video series on the U.S. Oh, healthcare I know. system. I want to ask you something about that, but go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> And, and it's, it's just like, I am learning so much about things that, that are not directly related to my job, but do affect mm -hmm. what I do as a physician, you mm -hmm. know, things that are below the surface, like pharmacy benefit managers and, and how, uh, you know, the, just the, so much about the pharmaceutical industry that we don't learn as yeah. physicians. Um, and, and some of the, the ways that the health insurance companies work and, uh, and denying claims and, and all these payment processing fees and billing. And I don't know, it's just, there's so much left on the bone that we don't get to in medical education, medical training that we need to. Even like how to run a business. I mean, you guys mm -hmm. don't get taught that at all in your medical training. And are, is it any surprise then that Why private we... equity is <sighs> running rampant? If you don't feel like you know how to run a business, then an, an offer to take care of that for you will be very attractive, don't you think? Why would we learn how to run a business when we'll all be working for United Healthcare? <laughs> exactly my point. Why. Exactly my point. But I want I did I want to I want to get back to you were going to answer the question of Yes, high risk specialties. High risk specialties. I'd like oh, to right. know yeah. what those are. So probably the highest risk are um OBGYN and uh general surgery, the surgical subspecialties, neurosurgery. Um, emergency medicine sort of top there in the top third. Uh, there's, I mean, here's the thing that um, Who's even safe? medical. <laughs> <laughs> you're not safe, Will. Nobody, <laughs> no one. Nobody is. No one's nobody safe. Is. Nobody is. No, I, nobody I, I, is safe. And actually, it, you know, 
some of the people that take it the hardest that I work with are people who in, were who like went into a specialty thinking it was safe. You know, I talk to mm-hmm. medical students and sometimes yeah. they want to know, they want to know what the higher specialties are so they they don't do them. And then yeah. when, you know, when you wind up being, um, you know, say family practitioners don't get sued as often as, as, as other, as other specialties. When you are a family physician and you're getting sued somehow, it's harder because you have this, mm. this feeling that this was not meant to happen. This wasn't supposed to happen. I was, I was going right. into a field that was supposed to be safer. And maybe that means I'm an even worse doctor because like it's supposed to be rare. It, you know, some, in some States I work with people who, cause I, I, you know, I work with people from all over the country and, you know, in States where they have greater protections, people are still getting sued. And when they, finally they're just like it wasn't supposed to happen because i live in this state and now i'm like one of the these few people getting sued in this state and now people must think that i'm like the worst thing ever because i live here and i'm getting sued so it's i don't know it's it's really a double-edged sword there's really there isn't any getting it's like death at the marketplace right like it's gonna find you <laughs> it's, it's gonna find you somehow right. and it would be far better if you were so one of my big questions i'll we can maybe we can talk a little bit more about how I got to doing what I do. But one of my big questions when I was sort of moving forward as in terms of thinking, like, how how do we get ourselves out of this? The two big questions really is like, one, what what would it take for doctors to be clear eyed about litigation? Like, what would it take for them to understand not just the skill set, but the mindset, everything that you need to be like, okay, I can face this. Like, what would it take for them to be clear eyed about litigation? And what would the direct and indirect benefits of that be? And I asked that question because what I know now is that like what I went through and that degree of suffering and like really rock bottom type stuff was not singular at all. Like, I know that that's not it's really common. And I know that litigation now, at least we have some data, but we know that litigation is a driver of suicide and of substance abuse and of, you know, divorce and certainly of career abandonment. We know all those things. Um, It has a tremendous effect on families. Like I was my, I was pregnant with my third child when I saw this patient. And when I finished up, she was in middle school And these, my three kids had grown up with this as like this dysfunctional thing that their mother was like, I don't even like to think about how it was sometimes, like the degree of stress that I was under and just like everything I did just to try to keep my stuff together, but it, and it wasn't working a lot of the time. Um, Mm. So what would the, the direct and the indirect effects of that be? Like, how would they practice differently? Would they practice less defensively? Would you have a better relationship with your patients? Like, would you be you know, unafraid to try new procedures that might help people. Would you, what, what would the, what would all those effects be if we could come into this process knowing how to deal with it? And actually like people laugh when I say like, I'm really like, if I, if I get deposed, if I have to prepare to um, testify at trial, like I'm good at that. Like I invited my residents to my second trial to watch me testify. Oh really? Yeah. Cause I know I'm, I know I'm good at it. It's a skill set yeah. and a mindset, right? You can be good at something and it's not a bad thing to be good at. Sure. Um, and so, I mean, those are really the things that were that were driving me forward, but it's just, you know, where do we start? Well, it's a big, it, big project. Right, yeah. right. And so where where do you recommend that people start when they, like, I, I can imagine, well, can you talk about that, just that first moment when you learned that you were getting there was litigation against you like that where were you like what if you if you don't mind talking about it like Mm -hmm. what's that what is that what is that feeling like because i imagine that's that's got to be one of the hardest moments yeah i i talk well so i I, when i talk about this i do talk about that moment um and there's um i'll mention i have a i have a podcast curriculum it's called doctors and litigation the l word and there is an episode where people talk about what that was like. And so, and there was somebody talking about getting served at Thanksgiving and somebody talking about getting served the day after her father, 
after her father's funeral and Ugh. like, and just people yeah. getting served by sheriffs at work. So mine was not as dramatic in terms of like, I was just served by a process server at, at work. And actually they didn't do it in the emergency department. I was in my chairman's office. And so it was, it was okay. Yeah. Except that I was like, it didn't matter. Like that drama part of it was taken out of the equation, which by the way, people don't understand that's like an opening salvo when you get served on Thanksgiving or when you get served by a sheriff at work, that is a strategic play. People do not oh, understand really? the strategy involved in this, but Oh yeah. Oh my gosh. Oh, like plaintiff yeah. attorneys understand the psychology of physicians and we are blind to the yeah. deliberate emotional manipulation baked into this process. We are, <laughs> this is again, part of the problem. We are completely blind to the manipulation. So anyway, for me, it was like, you know, like the whole bottom dropped out of the floor. I wanted to vomit. I had to sit down. I thought I was going to faint. I thought uh, just so many thoughts all at once, but most of it was probably just like overwhelming, like just fear and nausea. And yeah. also this sense of like, what happened? Like, I don't understand what happened. How did this happen? And then, of course, you're really not supposed to, like, go digging around in the record or anything at that point. you got to right. leave that alone and wait, um, you know, for your lawyer or someone else to get you the records to look at. But just, I remember my heart going a million miles an hour and just at complete and total panic. And also this feeling of, like, grief and guilt of, like, you know, this person, she was a young person. She was a young person. She was an engineer. And she came in to see me and something horrible horrible happened to her on my watch right so what do you do with that like what do you do with that feeling it was yeah you know it was horrible yeah that's and that's the other side of this right that's why i think why the the emotions are probably so complex yes is because uh, yeah you're you're up you're sick for yourself like you don't want to have to go through that this horrible process but there's also somebody hurting on the other side yes and i don't people at i'm guessing the vast majority of the time they're not just they don't go through this just no. for the hell of it right this no, is we a like huge to say thing things like that but i don't think that's true right and i think yeah when yeah. i talk about it too i always i and i i didn't today but you know when i usually give a talk or something like like in my disclosures i usually have a statement about how my talking about the suffering of physicians going through this process in no way negates the suffering of plaintiffs who have actually been harmed or who have had just bad things happen to them. Like they are also, for the most part, they are. So I'm not saying that there aren't cases out there that are money grabs. There are. We all know that, right? But a lot of times, and, and physicians have a different set of emotions around those, right? Like you're pissed off, you're angry, you're like, you know, you're really angry at the system. But, you know, for, for the most part, a lot of the times something bad happened to the patient. They didn't understand they don't understand. They think it probably was you. And mm, this is where we're going to get back to me asking you about your insurance videos because somewhere for this case to happen, someone has told them that this is a valid case, right? They've gone to an attorney. The attorney has a sense, but if the attorney doesn't know, what do they do? They find a medical expert. And the medical yes. expert, if I were, if I had your talents and I were making videos about this thing, and I could make a video, of, like I would take your peer-to-peer -peer person from the insurance company and I would make that my medical expert, right? Your medical expert <laughs> really? who is making, you know, bank at home. Now, there are good medical experts. I'm also going to say that. There are great medical experts out there and we need more of them. But there are a lot of people out there who are, we call them test liars, who will say or do anything for a buck. And the medical malpractice system would not survive without them, right? There would be no frivolous litigation if there weren't medical experts who yeah. are like, yeah, I'll say that there was malpractice here. Yeah, go for it. I will testify for you for 600 oh, bucks an so hour. that's so similar to the uh, health insurance doctors. I know. Yes. I know. Oh, my so, gosh. <laughs> that's the, wow. I'm like, what would it take for me to get <laughs> to make videos <laughs> All right, let, about let's, you expert know what? witnesses? <laughs> I want to I want to explore some of the because I know you have so many stories. So I want to explore like some of the interactions with, you know the, the the you know those medical experts or the the, the lawyers, the jurors, the judge, all that stuff. Oh uh, but let's take a quick break. All right. Okay. We'll be right back.
Hey, Kristen, how do I look? Oh, almost like a real doctor. I, I feel so natural with a stethoscope uh-huh. around my neck. Maybe I'll wear one around the eye clinic. Oh, let's see what people say. I, I don't know. They, I might look a little off. Well. But you know, this isn't just any stethoscope. Oh, what is it? This is the Echo Core 500 digital stethoscope with three lead ECG. Wow. Yeah, it's got 40 times noise amplification, noise cancellation, three audio filter modes, a full color display. Have you yeah. ever seen that? Fancy. A no, color I display. Haven't. A color display on a stethoscope. It's incredible. It's amazing. Uh, and it's also Echo's best sounding digital stethoscope. It provides the most precise sound through its innovative audio engineering design. We have a special offer for our U.S. listeners. Visit echohealth.com slash KKH and use code NOC50 to experience Echo's Core 500 digital stethoscope technology. That's E-K-O Health slash KKH and use knock 50 to get a 75 day risk free trial and free case and free shipping with this exclusive offer. Kristen, do you remember when I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life after training? I do. Eventually I decided on private practice and it was the best decision I have ever made. Hey. Okay. Glock and Flecken was probably the first. Uh, very funny. But it's really hard to start your own private practice. It is, especially in today's world. And that's why Independent Practice Partners is there. They want to help you start your own practice. And they will ensure that your practice doesn't just survive, but thrives. To find out more, go to ipracticepartners.com. Again, that's the letter I, practicepartners.com. <laughs> All right, we are back with Dr. Pensa, and it's a great, fascinating conversation so far. This is a whole world that we all need to know more about, but I, I want to know some of these some of these interactions, some of these these uh, things you've experienced, um, both personally and just you know, stories you've heard. So please let us know, what is it like in the, the day-to-day grind of going through one of these cases and 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 the depositions and interacting with, you know, lawyers and judges and all these things. Oh, wow. So that's a lot. Um, actually, so you had Emily Silverman <laughs> on here before. And so Emily Silverman, <laughs> yes. she did that shame and medicine series. I'm on one of those and I talk about like what it's like, you know, like walk in the courtroom and just the marble halls and there's just all these sensations coming at you. And I, I liken it very much to being like Alice in Wonderland, like you fall down a hole and you were like, what is happening right now? And, you know, you're like the star of the show somehow, but you have no idea, like no idea what's happening, no idea who to trust, no idea, like, should I eat that thing? They told me to eat it. I don't know if that's a good idea. Like, what's going to happen to me if I eat that? <laughs> like, just, you don't know anything. Um, right. But the the process moves super, super slowly, right? And so... Um, I hear there's I a lot would... of poisonings happening in courtrooms. So yes, <laughs> I, I totally, I get it. Okay. Well, you have, there's a generation that does not know Alice in Wonderland. I'm sorry. Like, yeah. I'm old. So like, if you don't know Alice in Wonderland, there's like the eat me, drink me thing. Yep. Like they, that's like, that's, that's for, right. okay. I, I'm sorry. I'm showing my age anyway. <laughs> no, I'm with you. I'm with you. I got it. Um, well, I'll tell you about my lawyer. So my lawyer was really interesting. So I was very bad at this. I think that's probably, that is um, maybe an understatement, right? I show up to this guy's office. I'm completely, like completely all over the place emotionally. And I feel like I'm supposed to be in charge here. And I'm like, you need to just make this thing go away. Like, I don't like, I don't think I did anything wrong. (laughs) Make this thing go away. And I was mad. I was really mad. And my lawyer, so funny. We were like oil and water at first. Um, so he's, a, so if people may not be watching, I'm a small person, right? I never really, you know, I thought I was very good at what I did. I always thought of myself as a big dog, but I'm like five one and, um, this little brown woman. And he was a big guy. He was older than me. And he was a very, very successful trial attorney, like really like the best around. Um, everyone was like, you got to have him. And, um, I did not like him did not like him. He was, he had been, uh, he was ex-military. Not only was he ex-military, he was like ex-special forces. And that's awesome. But he had no patience at all for my, like, my mental anguish. Like, <laughs> none, none, right. none, none. And 
there was also this sort of like undercurrent of sexism that really bugged me about this whole thing oh. where, you know, at some point, you know, we were on, we were like knocking heads a lot at first. Um, and he basically would just be like, shut up. I know what I'm doing. Just stop. <laughs> like, stop trying to drive this bus. You don't know how to drive it. And that was true. I didn't know how to drive yeah. it at all. But I had this very much this feeling of like, I want to be in charge because I was used to being in charge. I was used to being in charge and I was used to people yeah. listening to me. And I just, and I felt this need to control the situation that I could not control. Like I was not the expert. Yeah. Um, you needed to become the med student in the situation. Right. <laughs> I did. You were, I did. You, <laughs> I, I was not putty in this man's hands, like, which I was supposed right. to be, right? And so on, like, more than one occasion, like, he would tell me to, like, simmer down or to, like, you know, not get my panties in a bunch or something. And you, I, you just like, okay. <laughs> 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 was so mad. Um, but he was really good at what he did. And he also recognized that I sucked at this. And he got me a handler. So there was this junior attorney and all of a sudden I was his job. So another old reference, it was like a My Fair Lady thing. They were like, you're going to turn her into like a star witness. And he is just like, oh no, I can't do that. <laughs> that became a little bit job. of etiquette training for the courtroom. Yeah, was, exactly. <laughs> and he was like, oh crap, like this is hard. Um, and he actually on that podcast, I do an episode about how to prepare for deposition. And I interview him about like what made me so bad and the things that um, he had to teach me. Oh, and funny. like, and so we talk about, oh, wow. we talk about that process. And so you can learn about how to perform for your deposition from Ryan Dady on that, on that podcast many, many years after he was my handler. Um, but it was just, it was just this really surreal situation, but the main attorney was really, really, really good at what he did. Um, and I now, uh, really interestingly have a, I'm, I'm starting, a, I'm starting a company. I have two other co-founders. Um, one is Sheeta Shafi, who's a performance coach. Um, and the other is, um, Dorothea Calvano Linquist, who is a trial attorney. And she was, she actually was a trial attorney in his firm that came just as I, my case was ending. She was, she was, she'd been working with him. And um, we just have such interesting stories about him. Um, he was just like a great, great, great guy, but just had this need to like, I had to get put in my place, um, which is just a terrible thing. But one day he said to well, me, Well, and like, that's you... probably how he knows how to lead and how to, yes. uh, you know, right. be in charge of a situation. That's what he was trained in. Yeah, so. exactly. And I was like having none of it. Um, right. So he, once he was like, stop acting like you're the smartest person in the room. And I got so mad. I was just like, we are talking about vertebral artery dissections. Do you know what that is? Like, I know what that is. Do you know what that is? No, you don't know what that is. Nobody in this room knows what that is. I know what that is. Like, I am the smartest person in the room about this thing. And so I mean, like, really high emotions. And finally, he was just like, do you want to be the smartest person in the room or do you want to win this thing? And finally, yep. I was like, I want to win this thing. He's like, okay, yeah, right. So why don't you work with me? I'm like, oh, fine. There you go. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> that was sort of the beginning of learning how to do this. And part of it is really like, you know, you got to manage your emotions um, and sure. learn how it is that you're supposed to show up. And it's not what you think when you come in, because we want to come in, make the analogy all the time about like, we, we play tennis right? We're like in our tennis ways and things are supposed to make sense and blah, blah, blah. And then we show up there and they're playing football. And we're just like, what am I supposed to do with my racket right now? Like I, why, why is, you know, and they are full totally on like sport. tackle, yeah. completely different sport. And we are unprepared. Mm -hmm. We're totally unprepared. Now, now these things don't, don't always go to trial though, right? No, so you're, I know you're, you're talking about preparing for trial and I think they probably is it they rarely go to trial? Aren't these Probably typically settled beforehand? Yeah, most of okay. them settle. But when I say so be prepared, yeah. I say what the thing that's going to get you prepared the most is is knowing how to think about it. Like understanding what's going to happen and understanding what your role is. Because mm. so much of our anxiety is anticipatory anxiety, um, mostly because it's just this big black box. You don't know what's going to happen. No, you've never watched. You've never even watched anyone go through it. 
no idea. Like you've not seen, you didn't see anybody do it. You have no, literally zero knowledge about it. And so you come in just trying to act however you think you're supposed to show up, which is mostly like completely emotional and shame ridden or angry or belligerent or whatever. You don't know how to be. And so a lot of it is really this cultivation of like understanding mindset, what's going to happen, maybe take the, take the attend. If there ever is another attending that says, come watch me testify, go, because only a handful of my residents came. They, it was an open invitation. Oh, wow. And when yeah. I asked them, then why didn't you come? They said they were scared. Yeah. And they were like, it was, just, it was really frightening. It, I just didn't think I could deal with that, which is obviously that says something, right? Yeah. So you're, so you're in the, you're in the courtroom. I mean, this is, you said four and a half week trial initially. Mm, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. My first one was and, four and a half weeks. Second one was closer to three, but yeah. So, so you're, you're just, you're sitting there and, and how much are you just, are you like analyzing the reactions of the jurors and like the judge and like, Oh my God, is this, are they, who's side? I just can't imagine like that mindset of, oh, of sitting there so and listening to, to this for four weeks. There's so much to it. And so, but like you said, most people aren't going to get there, but it's so right. fascinating. Like as someone who's done the whole thing twice and I am like a social experiment, right? Like I did the first one and I kind of got through and I won, but it was like super traumatic. And then, so it's like trial a, and then this whole like social intervention thing and then me as a defendant in 2018, I was a totally different person, which to me is what proves that like skill set, mindset work, like learning about this can make you actually weather this well and perform with grace under pressure and do, you know, do a good job. Right. But it is, right. there are so many weird things about it. Like, all right. So, you know, the first thing that happens in any cases like jury selection, right? So first you walk in, they're clickety clack, all the courtrooms are all a marble or whatever. They're very imposing. All everything's echoing around and like you're, the sound mm -hmm. is like echoing in your ears. And then you go inside and the room is quiet. And then there, if you're there for jury selection, you're not always there for it. But if you are there for jury selection, it is fascinating. There are so many times where I'd be like, I wish I were a passive observer in this process because this is really, really interesting. But <laughs> but I need to panic right now. Um, and yeah. so they, you know, you hear these people, these good citizens of the public who are yeah. coming in to adjudicate this case and watching the lawyers do this voir dire, it's called, where they sort of get to ask, you know, they a lot of times they'll pull like numbers of jurors out of a, a, a bucket or something like that, a turn, whatever, whatever they use for the lottery, those things yeah. they turn around, they pull out numbers, the jury goes up, the juror goes up, potential juror, and they start asking them questions, right? And it's really interesting. You find out all these random things about people's lives. And then the, the, <laughs> how the, the lawyer is like jockey to like get people on the jury or dismiss people from the jury is also fascinating. Like there was one time I remember I was sitting with my lawyer during this process and every once in a while he'd like lean over me like, pencil, what's your take? And I'd be like, uh, like, I like that person. He'd be like, you're an idiot. <laughs> no, we don't want that person. <laughs> so, um, so like there was this really nice lady who I think of myself as I'm a pretty, like I'm a pretty liberal person. And like, do I listen to NPR? Yeah, I listen to that. And there was a woman up there who was, you know, she was said, they asked what radio stations or what do you listen to? What do you watch for news? All of that stuff matters, Right. And um, she said she listened to NPR, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I kind of, you know, afterwards I was like, I kind of like that lady. He was just like, you're an idiot. Like, no, you don't want the NPR people. Like, you're the man to those people. I'm like, I'm not the man. He's like, you're the man. Yeah. <laughs> That's not what he wants. <laughs> you want to go get coffee with that lady, but maybe you don't want her as your juror. <laughs> it, was, it was really, really interesting. Wow. Um, all the biases that come out and how, you know, the, yes. the, the lawyers get, to strike a couple of people, well, it changes all the time what the rules are, but they get to strike some jurors for cause, meaning they they pull out some evidence of bias and they say like, okay, I don't want this person on. So you'll never get like a healthcare professional on the jury because the plaintiff's attorney will be like, mm -hmm. bye, immediately. No way. Um, yep. Anyone who seems to understand medicine will not be on the jury. Um, anyone who says they'd had a good experience in medicine will not be on the jury. Like they will try to get all those people and then they can knock some people off like without cause as long as it's not like racism or gender or whatever they get a couple of strikes like nope not taking those people but the but there's a certain number that they get so the machinations that they go through 
to think about like, do we want this one? Do we want that yeah. one? Like the questions that they mm -hmm. asked to try and like guess, like, is this going to be a favorable jury or not? And for me, like there was a lot of, he was again, coming down to like the sexism thing was really interesting. He's like, we want men on the jury. And I was like, what? Excuse me. He's like, men, men are gonna be more sympathetic to you. I was like, why? He's like, just trust mm -hmm. me. We want men. And I actually did wind up with a jury that was both times that were predominantly men. And I don't really understand the whys and wherefores of that, but he thought that that was mm. benevolent that that was sexism. Important. Yep. Where yeah, men feel exactly. like their Maybe job is to protect the cute little lady. Something mm -hmm. like that, which also pissed yeah. me off, but I was, I learned yeah. to restrain that sort of thing. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yep. I, you know, I served. I've served on a jury once. Did Have you? I did. I did. Yes. Uh, they when did would, that happen? Uh, this is a, a couple years ago uh, while we've been living here. But uh, the jury no selection was very. How did she not was, know? <laughs> Where does she think you like, were? <laughs> it was a, like a four four hour process of jury selection. The, the case itself lasted about forty five minutes. Oh, so okay. it yeah. was uh, <laughs> it was all done in a day. Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh my god. So, That's probably why I didn't know. I thought you were yeah. probably just at work. They're like, oh my god, four <laughs> and a half weeks. Are you kidding me? Yeah. And, and so like, that's what, what I'm saying. Like, I can't like. imagine that. Like that's so. Yeah. Oh yes, yeah, so you were asking about like okay, like so yeah. Every day you come in and they're trying to they're trying to size their whole job is to size you up, right? Because they know nothing about like all these experts come in and we can talk about that too. But they come in and they like tell these stories and they're supposed to be understanding and they're all like nodding their head. They don't understand a lot of like a complicated case. I mean, they understand like someone you leave a sponge in somebody, they get that, right? But mm -hmm. if we're talking about like whether or not eye pain and, ver and vertebral artery dissection are supposed to go together somehow and whether or not I should have done X, Y, and Z or heparin versus ass, they don't know. Um, and now I'm thinking about it. I You're going to be... I can't. Eliminating on this one. Well, that, that, <laughs> well, that yeah. doesn't make. I mean, because like like a like a central retinal artery occlusion that that's painless vision loss. So I, I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, it doesn't make sense. Please you'll, you'll like Anyway, you'll be like me, like every which way from Tuesday trying to figure it out. It doesn't make a lot of sense, except yeah, that it right. put my whole life on hold for a long time. I think, but too that the general public, which is what the jury is made of, has you know can have this idea that in medicine there's there's it's science right so there's like a right mm -hmm. way and a wrong way and there's what you should do and what you shouldn't do and i don't think there is really widespread understanding that it's it's a little grayer than that mm -hmm. it's not so black and white and there's an art to it as well as a science and there's not always one right answer or even a clear answer mm -hmm. no um, so you so that would be up, so tough like hoping you start to pin your hopes on people like for for me like, okay, so the optics start the minute you get there, right? So my lawyer mm -hmm. made me ride in the, like, the back of his truck where um, he had very nice cars. He did not drive them to court. And so I would have to meet him at his office every morning and I'd get in the back of this car and he used to hunt and he had hunting dogs and he would have all this dog crap in the, not actual crap, but like dog paraphernalia yeah. in the back, like <laughs> blankets and all this stuff. And I would have to sit back yeah. with them and they'd be like, no, when we pull up, they're going to watch you get out of the back of this truck. And I was like, okay. So I'd sit in the back with, cause the, cause the handler lawyer was in the other front seat. So I sat in the back with the dog stuff. And so from the moment, he's like, when, from the minute you get out of that truck, you are acting a certain way. Like you are mm -hmm. consummate professional. You say good morning to everybody. You hold the door. You smile politely. You are like, you are on from the minute you get out of here. You got that? I'm like, got it. You know, so like, I, I mean, yeah. really, you have to mm -hmm. picture this guy. He was like, really, really something. So, sir, um, yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> I, I never <laughs> got quite to yes, sir, but like, I, I did listen. Close. To him. I did listen to him. But there was one juror, I mean, some jurors pay attention and some jurors don't. They're just, they're people, right? There was one guy in one trial who fell asleep at like 10 o'clock every day. Like he just like would settle in for his nap and mm -hmm. he slept. Like he missed so much. So I'm like, that guy, that guy is going to be like, <laughs> like, like deciding your fate. Wow, that's so maddening. <laughs> wow. And then oh, there man. was, I'll tell you one story about one juror. So. On three separate occasions, jurors have come to the emergency department asking for me by name, which is when I teach people how, when I talk to people about how to testify well at trial, you are testifying in a way so that they would want to join your practice. They, they don't need you to be perfect. They need you to be empathetic. Mm -hmm. They need you to show that you care about your patients. Like you don't even have to always be right. But if you could show grace under pressure, if you can be 
caring in the face of like a lot of stuff coming at you, if you can explain things well, um, they're going to, they love you that they want to, they really, they really want to. Um, and so they're not looking for arrogance. They're not looking for like this egomaniac. They're not looking for the smartest person in the room. They are, they are looking for someone who they would want to take their family to. And so I've had this really interesting experience where now two of the times I was there and one time I, I wasn't, but that's actually really, that's a really interesting story because that person had a vertebral artery dissection and thought that they knew all about it, but they didn't, but I, I didn't get to take care of that person. Um, but there was one guy, I'll tell you this story because it was just, I don't know, it's just sort of emblematic of things that happen. Um, there was one in one of the trials, I won't, I won't say which, but, um, there was, you get your hopes pinned on someone because they're like, there are people that seem like they're paying attention and you kind of watch their faces without being creepy, but you just try and, you know, you're looking around the room politely and you know that they're watching you. Um, but you're also trying to see if you can like get them to look at you and see you as like a really nice caring person. And there was one guy who I'd heard, like I heard the voir dire and I knew what he did and he did something, you know, he was very accomplished and had gone to Ivy league schools and did like, he was smart. And I was like, that guy is going to get this. He's going to get that. Like I couldn't have done anything else in this case. And like, I'm pinning all my hopes on this guy. And what you don't realize is like, sometimes you pass them in the hallway Sometimes they'll be like a female juror. They might be in the bathroom. Sometimes like you go to the bodega down the street to get something at lunch and then they come in after you and you're not supposed to talk to them, right? But mm. there is this sort of nonverbal thing going on. And so one day I, in a break, I was walking down the marble steps and he was walking up and you don't want to not look at them because that's weird, right? So I just was like, all right, that's the guy. Like that's, it's like almost like, I don't know, it's just like in high school. And I'm like, oh my God, that's the guy. Do I look at the guy? I don't know. Uh, so <laughs> I, so I looked at him and I had like what I thought was just sort of like a friendly look on my face and he looked at me and he smiled and I was like, oh, okay, okay. That guy's probably <laughs> on my side. That guy's probably on my side. And then I was really like, so you're just doing this thing, this guessing game yeah. until, oh, and man. so when you testify and you're looking for the faces that you think are friendly, like you're talking to the plaintiff's attorney or your attorney, you're talking to the jury, you're trying to like look at the faces that you think are friendly. Um, that happened a couple of times, like in the bodega, there was a guy that, you know, walking in, walking out. And I was like trying not to say anything. And he was like, good morning, doctor. And I was like, good morning. Like, yeah. And I was like, I got that one too. <laughs> like, there you awesome. go. Two down. <laughs> um, but the guy who was really, you know, um, that guy that I pinned all my hopes on, you know, I was just yeah. so, you know, the, eventually it was a, a verdict in my favor and happy about everything. And then I don't know how many months later, maybe six months later, um, working in the ER and the ambulance brings somebody in and it's him. And he is highly, highly intoxicated. And he looks at me and he was like, Dr. Pensa, and we've never spoken. Like we've seen each other. We smiled at each other. Like mm -hmm. we've exchanged looks for like a month. Right. He looks at me and he goes, Dr. Pensa, I love you and I'm really glad you're here because I need help. Can I give you a hug? And normally wow. I'm like mm, on the hugs and the like the people who come in who are intoxicated in the emergency department. Yeah. And I've just proclaimed love for you. And yeah, yeah. I, I was That's just it. like, <laughs> okay, you know, and so I gave him a hug. And so, wow. uh, you know, he had a he had a alcohol problem um and had been sober for many 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 years very very successful fell off the wagon and this is a hard thing in er there's not a lot of a lot of the resources aren't you know there aren't a ton of resources but i actually did manage to get him into um i got him into detox and then he went to rehab and we actually saw him on and off for a while after that and then like i saw him a couple more times and so did my colleagues and then um then he got sober um, and so wow. like a year after that, like we don't get a lot of thank yous in emergency medicine, but he sent like cupcakes to the ER and was like a year, a year sober. And like, I feel like I have this real connection with you and, um, thank you for helping me get That's sober. Awesome. And, yeah. It was just really, it was really That's interesting. Great. Um, wow. and I've seen him like out and That's about. A, That's such a cool story. Uh, you know, it, yeah, cool it's story. just one of these like strange things happen. Yeah. I mean, there are people yeah. that like, these are, all, going these are people in, in, in your community. These yeah. are people in your community. They're on your tr on your trial, your jury trial, and 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 then so uh, just wow, 
we could continue talking to you for forever. I mean, I've got so many questions, but we'll maybe we'll save it for another time. I just want to thank you so much for joining us. Um, My and I also, I, I just think it's, you know, Kristen does this for her, her experience as a co survivor of medical trauma. Um, it's so much of what you said about just not knowing where to turn, not knowing where to yeah, find I information. I was thinking the same thing. As I, I, I've heard so many of the same things from Kristen about her experience um, mm, right. you know, with the healthcare system. And so thank you for, for taking that on this very important topic and putting together resources and uh, something that, that physicians, that people can turn to for help. Um, because uh, clearly just the psychological toll of this topic yeah, you know, of of this on the people involved is just it's something that needed to be we need help with. So I want to do a little PSA too that you know things are scarier in the dark. Like if if you are ignorant about something willfully, it's going to be scarier. You know, what, yes. learning about something makes it less scary, not more scary. And right. watching something happen from a safe distance makes it less scary, not more scary. So. I don't know. I just I get I get the hesitancy and, you know, people don't like to feel scared. But I mm -hmm. think, you know, what I have learned in the many situations we've been in is the only you know way to get over that is to just push through it. Just do the thing. And then you see that you can do the thing and it's not as scary the next time. Yeah. A thousand percent. A thousand percent. Well, Thank you. Tell us. Tell us where. Um, where people can find you, the thing, the, your services that you provide, the mm -hmm. uh, resources, all this stuff. Give sure. Just a rundown. So, uh, so my website is doctorsandlitigation.com. Uh, the podcast is called Doctors and Litigation, the L Word. Um, mm -hmm. and, so, and they can find me uh, at both of, those, both of those sites. I am uh, starting a company. Um, you will hopefully hear about us soon. Our, our hope is to really really change the way this is done. I'm working with insurance companies and attorneys. I mentioned my partners. Um, our, our goal is, you know, really, I don't want any doctor ever showing up the way that I showed up, um, completely unprepared, completely afraid. Um, and I think that there are ways from, you know, the insurer and the legal perspective, from the educational perspective, from the individual physician perspective, to be unafraid to find out that information. I think that we, I'm not arrogant enough to say that I know exactly how we should be doing this right now. But I, I have learned a lot coaching physicians through this in the last few years. Um, I've and just like the, the messages I've received from people, like, I know that we can do this better than we're doing this now. I know yeah. that we can. And so that's, that's where, that's where I'm going. That's great. Well, good for you for creating what you, yeah. what you wanted that wasn't there. You're going to make a big difference to a lot of people. I hope so. Thank you. And also uh, Gita Pinsa on Instagram at Gita Pinsa MD on Twitter or X or whatever you want to call it. Um, <laughs> thank you so much uh, for joining us. It really has been a pleasure speaking with you. This has been, can I say it's a dream of mine? I don't know. Uh, if I knew all oh, I had to do was get sued to get on this show, nice. I would have done it sooner. <laughs> you hear that everyone? No, don't please, please don't take that. Uh, no, 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 if no, no, the no. choice is between getting sued or coming on here, we'll let you do it before you get sued. So, <laughs> No, it really. <laughs> Just tell our producers the lengths you're willing to go to, and yes, sure exactly. they'll let you. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's well, been a thanks real again. Honor. Thank you. Absolutely. Take care. Fascinating topic. Yeah, we could have just gone on for hours. There's so much more to say, I, I think, with all of that. Yeah, I it definitely, I'm going to check out her podcast. Series. Yeah. I haven't, I haven't heard any of those. And um, I just, uh, I, I like, I like things that we should know about but we don't right you know there's so <laughs> like, many of them <laughs> it's just exactly and um it's a it's a whole like she mentioned several times a whole different world so man yeah and what a just a harrowing difficult like describing what it was like 12 years yeah 12 years of your life to to get through that and I, i've heard that about about litigation and malpractice litigation that it, it just can be years right it and so forever. Um, i feel like that's part of the the tactic too right i mean i think it's it's partly because our court system is crowded system. but but uh but it does something psychologically to you when it goes on and on like that so fascinating so yeah check out uh, uh dr gita pensa and all the wonderful work she's doing 
Um, thank you all for listening. And it, we didn't get to, to listener stories today, but th- this we we went a little long. That's okay. It was just, I, I couldn't, I, I, we, I had to listen as much as she could tell us. And I <laughs> yes. didn't, but I didn't want the episode to go like two or three hours long, but it easily right. could have. Um, so, so we haven't forgotten the, we the haven't... listener stories or the games, and that will be back. Don't worry. Can I we tell just... you what the game was going to be? If we sure. Had time? It was or just... do you want to use it again later and you don't want to say so? Well, no, I was say it was, it was called Doctors and Lawyers and Such. Oh, okay. It was like I had a series of Latin phrases, mm-hmm. and you, I was going to make you guess if they were doctor phrases or lawyer <laughs> phrases. <laughs> I'll save it for another time, though, because... <laughs> Eventually, I'm sure. We'll, in fact, hey, if there are, if you know of any like malpractice uh, lawyers, I think that would be interesting to talk with like oh, yeah. someone on the, the if any any militant <laughs> malpractice lawyers <laughs> right. uh, want to come and uh, and talk with us, we'd love to hear you. Yeah. Uh, have you hear you both? Um, or if you want to make up a Latin term and have us guess what it is, there you go. You can do that too. Send There's it lots on of in. ways to reach us. By the way, you can email us knock knock high at human dash content dot com. We're on all the social media platforms. You can hang out with us and our human content podcast family on Instagram and TikTok at human content pods. Thank you all for the the wonderful listeners. You're all wonderful. You're incredible. You're fantastic, and you're also leaving awesome reviews. I know all of you are. Uh, if you subscribe and comment on your favorite podcasting app or on YouTube, we can give you a shout out. Like Mindy on Apple said, the conversation with Ma Glock and Flecken was one of the cutest and funniest things I've ever heard. Oh, my mom is going to eat that up. Oh yeah, right now she's, she's a li- character. Right, right now she just heard that and she is beaming. She is she is uh, just uh, over the moon. From that comment Oh my alone. gosh, Ron! That's what she just said. <laughs> <laughs> Full video episodes are up every week on my YouTube channel at D Glock and Flecken, so check that out. We also have a Patreon, lots of fun perks, bonus episodes where we react to medical shows and movies. We have a wonderful community of people. A little town, like uh, the Pawnee, Indiana. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But maybe a little more competent. A little bit more competent. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> we're there. We're active in the community and the Knock Knock High member community. Mm-hmm. Uh, at early ad free episode access as a Patreon member. Interactive QA live stream events. Much more. Patreon.com slash Glock and Flecken or go to Glock and You know, I'm sure that the real Pawnee, Indiana is perfectly competent. We were obviously oh, referencing oh. the fictional version. I don't think Pawnee is a real place. Is it not? I think it, I thought it was. I don't think we'll it's have to real. look. I'm like I'm look 99% right sure Pawnee is not a real place. Let's see. Okay, she's, while she looks that up, uh, speaking of Patreon community perks, we have new member shout out Richard the First. I think that's her first. Richard I, Richard the First, one of the two. You can be <sighs> Richard the First. It's like you're like a royalty. Thank you, Richard, for joining Patreon. What is it? It was based on Muncie. That's what I'm thinking of, which is where oh. Jerry is from oh, in the gotcha. show. Okay. So right. it, my bad. I got those mixed up. Shout out to all the Jonathans. Patrick, Lucia, C, Sharon, S, Omar, Edward, K, Stephen G, Ross Box, Jonathan F. M- I'm struggling. Marion <laughs> W, Mr. Granddaddy, Caitlin C, Brianna L, Dr. J, Chaver W, Leah D, K, L, Rachel L, and Ann P. Thank you all. A virtual head nod to you. Patreon Roulette, shout out to a random person from our emergency medicine tier. Shout out to Capt Main Waring being a Patreon. Pa- Patreon. <laughs> Patreon. A patron on Patreon. That's Thank right. You. Thank you, Captain Main Wa- Captain Main Waring. Yes. I like your name. He's got lots of suggestions. I recognize that name. He's, he's always given us some yes, good suggestions. Yes, he does. He, I love those suggestions. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's what we do. We, the, we listen to our community here. We, right. we get lots of fun comments and, and suggestions. Thank you all for listening. We are your host, Will and Kristen Flannery, also known as the Glock and Fleckens. A special thanks to our guest, Dr. Gita Pensa. Our executive producers are Will Flannery, Kristen Flannery, Aaron Corney, Rob Goldman, and Shanti Brooke. Our editor and engineer, Jason Portizo. Our music is by Omer Binsvi. Okay, big breath. To learn about our Night Night Highs program, disclaimer, ethics policy, submission, verification, and licensing terms, and HIPAA release terms, you can go to glockandfleckens.com or reach out to us at knockknockhigh at human-content.com with any questions, concerns, or fun medical jokes. 
or puns. You know what? I think one of the games coming up is going to be like trivia about our program disclaimer and ethics policy. Oh, that's a and good one. Like that. I think speaking of our patrons, I think they might be the only ones who listen all the way to this point. Yes, so had, hi, patrons. We had a little live stream where I asked how many people listen this far into the podcast, and they did. They, yeah. they, they, they absolutely. I was. Right. I was they very were. Impressed. They were sending you back some of the jokes that you make so we know they really do absolutely so thank you knock knock high is a human content production Thanks for watching the episode. You can find more on that playlist over there. If you prefer to listen or you just had your eyes dilated, you can binge full episodes wherever you get your podcasts or join the party over on Patreon where you get early access episodes, hang out with us, get lots of exclusive bonus content. Hope you subscribe, leave a comment below. Let us know what you think.